Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Darius is here, our watch back with uh, Professor Alejandro. Uh, yeah, please. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, good job. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Darish. Today I talk about large scale network infrastructure. Water and energy are interdependent. We need water, we need water for energy. For example, hydropower generators, uh, cooling system in thermonuclear power plants and nuclear power plants. We also need energy for water, for pumping, for treatment, and for some other things. So the, the reality is that we knew this interdependence since the beginning. So now the question is why are to, today we want to talk about this interdependence. The problem is that sometimes we have access to resources for a long time, that we do not pay attention that these resources are becoming scarce, and that we, we, we have some uh, problems in the near future. There was, there, was a, uh, there was a survey done in recent, in recent years in a large city, and someone went out and asked around 60 people, what would be the one thing that you cannot live without? And out of 60 people, no one, no one said water. Uh, can you imagine what would be the answer? <laughs> cell phone. So people, they say they cannot live without, without their cell phone, but they, cannot, they, but they can live with, uh, without water. So, the reality is that we not pay attention to our resources. So now the question is why an integrated uh, design approach? Why do we need to be worried about this interdependence today? Number one, the first is climate change, climate variations. We have had uh, severe droughts in California, in Texas, in, in other countries such as India. Due to these uh, climate variations and climate uh, uh, variabilities, we, uh, we solved our infrastructure, we had to, we are becoming more and more vulnerable. For example, power plants, we have we had to shut down some of the power plants over the last few years. In 2007, in the Tennessee Valley operated, uh, we had to shut down nuclear and coal, fire, uh, coal uh, nuclear and coal fired power plants due to high water temperature. And also in 2006, in 2003 in France. So we have had the same problem in different areas around the globe. We also have problems with uh, hydropower generators. We do not have access to enough water to generate electricity. So in summary, climate variations and climate uncertainty is becoming more and more frequent. So because of that, our infrastructures are becoming more and more vulnerable to such variations. Another reason, population growth. Population is increasing. Uh, global population is increasing. In the last 100 years, uh, the global population tripled, and the demand for water it has increased sevenfold, almost sevenfold. So, uh, population is increasing. We can maybe we can control the population or not. This is one problem. But the major problem is that more than half of this population lives in cities, in large cities. So, basically, half of this population lives in cities, and they need infrastructure. So, as you can see in this uh, right figure, we have the uh, you know. In the world, we have more than 50% 50, 50 of the population is in large cities, and in developed countries, this problem becomes uh, worse and worse. More than 70% of the population lives in large cities. So basically, in the uh, near future, we will have a stress on large scale infrastructures in energy systems and in uh, water systems. Another reason, new technologies. Over the last 20 years, we have been able to improve our technology. We have been able to improve the efficiency of different uh, technologies in different sectors, for example, water systems or energy systems. But again, to go back to my first slide, we, in each sector, we just focus on the objectives in, the, in that sector. For example, in water system, we have tried to optimize our objectives in, for water, water network operators. Or in energy systems, we have tried to optimize our objectives for energy systems. We did not pay attention to the coupling between these two infrastructure. So now, today, it's, uh, it's the time for us to be more careful about this coupling. And we need to address objectives in both uh, do domains, in energy and water. And today, I'm talk I only talk about water and energy because in recent years, I've focused on <coughs> water and energy systems. 
Today we have problems with our resources. We do not have access to enough resources. And because of climate variation, exponential pop, uh, population growth, and because of the obsolete, uh, obsolete policies given by the supply demand solutions that we have had over the last years. So in the near future, we need to adopt a new perspective. We need to adopt a nexus perspective in order to address uh, you know, this uh, objective in both energy and water domains. We need to consider objective in that are we need to consider the coupling between these two domains. So integrated design approach. So basically, if you just look at this energy and water systems, and so basically in both of these domains, we have some uh, different technologies. We need to control these technologies. So basically today we have a system of systems. We do not have only one system. We have system of systems, and we need to add this objective in both of these uh, domains. Today I talk about uh, some of my recent works. I mainly focused on in the last two three years. I focused on the area of energy and water and the intersection between energy and water. And especially today I talk about uh, my one of my works in, uh, in the area of energy systems in microgrids, and I also talk about my work in a uh, water system, water and energy, optimal water flow and renewable energy harvesting in water. Let's talk about uh, energy systems, my work in energy systems. So microgrids, we have microgrids today, we have a group of loads, distributed energy resources that are connected via an uh, electrical network. So microgrids can operate in islanded mode or uh, grid connected. In islanded mode, we have the, the market operator is responsible for maintaining the balance between demand and supply. And however, in a grid connected mode, the market grid can be seen as a controllable entity connected to the grid, and we can provide some service, different kinds of services to the uh, ball power system. In this study, the focus of this study is uh, about optimal control of grid connected market grids for providing ancillary services, in particular, frequency regulation services to the grid. Okay, what is the time and what is the framework? So, okay, here's the timeline framework. The market operator needs to compute yeah, its offer, how much downward or upward regulation can provide for the uh, bulk power system, and then submit the offer to the energy and regulation market. The market gets cleared, and so we, in real time, we have to uh, respond to some regulation signals sent by the operator. So, what do I mean by uh, regulation? So, okay. Let's consider a contract of duration T, capital T, and assume that time is slotted in time slot of size delta. So we have K time slot in the contract, and we have K, we receive K signal from the uh, system operator. Here we assume that every double time slot, the system operator sends a new regulation signal that is between the bounds computed in advance. Basically, the maximum downward and upward regulation services that we promise to provide. And the market operator is going to do, uh, withdraw some power from the grid or provide uh, or supply some power to the grid. Any questions or comments? Okay. In this study, in this talk, I just focus on real time operation and try to uh, I, I explain how what was my contribution in this area. So, we developed a family of controllers for, com for computing the set points of the dis uh, DR, distributed energy resources, and we proved that. These controllers they converge to an optimal solution of the problem, of the set point computation problem. And if prove that these controllers they compute of uh, feasible power flows for the system at each time slot. Okay. Now, let's talk about the physical layer. We consider a lossless microgrid. However, the results can be extended to loss microgrids with uh, homogeneous R2 ratios. And then we consider three, we have three kinds of buses, generator bus, load bus, and the Thailand bus. So we have generator bus, load bus, and Thailand buses. So at, at, and in generator for load or, or Thailand bus, we have some uh, limits on how much we can inject power, active, how much active power can inject into the grid. We assume we consider uh, both controllable and uncontrollable loads. And we have a Thailand. So, for the timeline, the power exchange or the timeline between the microgrid and the grid has two components. One is the energy component, which is fixed over the contract duration. And, and another component is the perturbation along the fixed component, which represents the uh, regulation effort, uh, which try to provide uh, to the bulk power system. The network can be represented by an undirected graph. 
set of the set of nodes and the set of regions. We uh, also consider bound on the power flow over the each line, basically, you know, over each line between node I and J. The power flow over uh, this line is limited, but there are some bounds on this uh, part. Physical layer. Uh, we talk about physical layer, now it's cyber layer. We want to compute the state point in this distributed fashion, so the nodes need to talk to each other. So we assume that the communication network has the same topology as the physical layer network. And at each bus I, at each bus I, we have a controller, we have, we have a transceiver. So the, uh, the transceiver uh, transmits the information to, this, to the neighbors of bus I, and the controller computes the set points. Here, in this study, we only assume that uh, the market operator communicates with the Thailand buses. So uh, that, that is the only communication with, uh, for the market operator. So market operator is going to receive some regulation signal and it's going to divide the regulation signal between its uh, Thailand according to their capacity. The communication graph directed or indirectly? It's directly. You see it? Something semantic meaning if I talk to you, you may not be able to talk to me. I uh, one way is necessary, the other way is not necessary. Uh, based on my understanding this time, yes. So the only, I explained the control nodes, so which node they need to uh, send the feedback information. So let's say I have, there's a line between um, I and you, it's between us, so, uh, and the particle of, I send some, I have some particle from, let's say, I node I to node J, so I need the feedback information at node J to be sent to, uh, to node I. And not vice versa? No, not vice versa. Yeah. Okay. Now the set point computation. Okay, now to compute the set point, we have set of uh, objectives. We need to ensure that the system is balanced, load is equal to supply, and we need to ensure that the system is going to synchronize the, uh, we need to ensure that phase coincidence function is satisfied, and we need to ensure that we can respond to the regulation signal. Basically, okay, we need, want to minimize the, uh, the cost of failing to follow the, uh, follow the regulation signal. So the problem formation can be as follows. I should say that, in this study, we do not consider cross-time correlation between different time slots. So we focus on the online study. At each time slot k, we want to minimize the cost of failing to follow the, uh, the regulation signal, subject to uh, physical layer. So basically, the set point and injections and the power flow over different lines. And the other phase coincidence constraint and power flow, uh, power injection, the uh, bounds on the injections or loss. Why? Gamma is the is the gamma matrix, right? Gamma is matrix. <coughs> Why are you making it time varying? Uh, because of the voltages. I mean, we can assume they're constant. Right? I see. Okay. Okay. It's a quick question. Yes. Why do you want the phase coefficient constraint? What does it guarantee? You want to ensure the the particles are feasible for the system, and basically the system can converge. This the here they can uh, they are, the phase angle they're close enough to each other. Both asking why do you want that? What is that guaranteeing? Synchronization. Okay. Okay. Non but why synchronization? We're designing a control law that may be dynamic, right? I don't care about synchronization at every point in time as you're executing the control law. Right. Synchronization is an asymptotic concept. Right. So why why do you care about synchronization when you're thinking about a dynamic controller and you're imposing it at every stage of this? You're imposing it on every key. Right. Why do you care about? You're saying so we can take care at. Uh, so if you do that at each step, you are satisfying this constraint. But, uh, what you're saying is that we can, we can we need to ensure that at the end of the uh, solution box at the end, we need, just need to satisfy this constant. Right? Yeah, I, I think that's that, 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 that the, the light model is not really dynamic, it's static, it has the power flow model. Mm -hmm. So the, there are no, the VRs they don't have dynamics, they are just like a negative injections. Right. So basically, only the set points, then we want to make sure the set points satisfy this condition. Right? 
Or in a sense, it's a time scale separation. What you're saying is basically that this imposition, that time difference between one time step and the second in your algorithm, within that, you are assuming that the system will go to its uh, steady state. Right. And that steady state, you want to ensure that synchronization is. Yes, so at each time is. At each time is. If you ensure this, then between, between that time slot and the next, it will already be synchronized. Right. So, okay, thanks. So uh, we transfer the problem, the problem formulation, the prob this problem into a lower space model. So here, we, in this formulation, we have a phase angle, we have injections, and we now talk about uh, flows over different lines and uh, injections. We transfer this problem into this uh, transfer into a flow space model, and now we have a uh, now we have a uh, non-convex constraint in a recent study by my collaborators. Uh, collaborators uh, Maddie and uh, Professor Benigno Garcia, they show that we can uh, we can remove this constraint and write the problem and update the parts of the update the, uh, this box constraint. Basically, we can update the uh, upper and lower bounds on the flows over different lines and compute uh, a new, uh, uh, and come up with an inner approximation for this problem. So now we focus on this problem and we try to uh, our goal is to compute the so now we uh, have a setup. We want to come up with a setup uh, decentralized control box. Okay, we need to uh, we need to compute the set points for the generators and the loads. And to do that, we need to uh, compute a set of feedback information. So to compute the feedback information, we propose the controllers for the Thailand and for the outgoing uh, outgoing particles. I show you later. So let's focus on the feedback information. Consider bus I, there are some incoming flows and some outgoing flows. At each bus I, we measure the incoming flows and we compute the outgoing flows. This computation is only for computing the feedback information. Okay. Basically, we define this uh, indicator. We need to compute the, we need to we need to compute the value of this indicator. So what does that what does this indicator mean? Uh, so okay, let's consider a generator bus. This indicator is equal to one if the incoming flows into bus I is greater than the outgoing flow, and it's equal to minus one if the uh, incoming flows are less than the outgoing flow. So basically, if the this node is congested, it's going to be equal to one, and otherwise it's going to be minus one. So now to compute this indicator, we need to compute the flows. We measure the incoming flows, and we need to compute the outgoing flows. So now we propose this adaptation uh, law to compute the outgoing flows. Okay. To compute the output flows, we have a set of design parameters, alpha and beta. Forget that for now. I'll talk about them later. <coughs> now we have a set of indicators. Okay, we have UI and UJ. They uh, say that okay, if UI is congested, it's equal to one. So it means that you have to increase the flow. Alpha and beta are positive. And if UJ and if it is not congested, you should decrease your flow. Basically, if it is congested, you need to have more output flow. And UJ, your neighbor. If it is congested, you can you should decrease the outgoing flow between node I and node J. And if it is uh, congested, you should uh, you should not not congested, you should increase your flow. This indicator they just uh, ensure that the power flow over this line uh, satisfies the uh, the basically the upper and lower bound and the power flows over the over the line I and J. Any questions or comments? Is it clear? Okay. We have the similar adaptation law for the tie lines. I'm not going to talk about that. Let's move to the uh, adaptation law for computing the set point at the generator bus. So we need to compute the set point at each generator bus. Okay. So here is the adaptation law. Again, we have design parameters and we have so UIJ and UI underline UI, uh, uh, overline J, they ensure that the set point at bus I satisfies the generation needs. And here you have this component. If basically if bus I is congested, you are going to uh, decrease your injection at bus. And if it is not congested, you are going to uh, increase the. You can increase the uh, injection at bus. Can you okay. go back a couple of slides? Sure. Uh, there. So you have those two indicator variables, UI, UJ, 
I is uh, associated to the serving node, J is associated to the receiving node. Right. Who updates uh, UI? Node I, right? You yeah, node I. Who updates UJ? Node J. So that means that UJ, that node J has to communicate with node I, right? So node J sends the information to node I. But uh, node uh, J doesn't get anything from node I? No. Because okay. you need only to compute the output. I see. Okay. okay. Something that I perhaps have missed. What information is the controller using? Is the controller using? So this, so we have basically we have. This is the information that we exchange between the nodes. My more important question, perhaps, is: Is the regulation signal random, or is it something that you have assumed this is the profile? Given the profile, you're so okay. Let's go back. So we receive the regulation signal. You yeah, at the time slot K. We receive the regulation signal. The, uh, the operator divides the regulation signal between the Thailand. So we have our IK for each Thailand. So the value of the regulation signal is known at this time. Only for that time step. Only for that time step, yes. But then the control that we were designing, it bases itself based on, <coughs> uh, sorry, it is based on the information of RIK that the microgrid operator sends to each time. Okay, and your algorithm then may violate constraints intermediate in, during the trajectory, right, over the trajectory, but, and your goal is asymptotically you're going to, uh, or within time K you're going to reach Right. Yes, so when we ensure that at each time instant, we put, we generate a set points that are feasible for the system. We might we might be some uh, we might not be able to follow the, the the signal perfectly, but we ensure that the set points are feasible for the system. And we have some theoretical. So your algorithm runs on a different time scale than the regulation. Than their regulation. Uh, let me show you. So basically, okay, the every W time slots, we receive a new regulation signal. So the value of the regulation is fixed here, okay? So over the first few uh, time slots, the algorithm <coughs> runs and computes uh, the new set points. So let's say over two time slots, comp runs and compute the, uh, compute the set points. So over these time slots, we, we just ensure that the system is fixed. But it might not be perfect. Okay. So this is a two times scale sort of. Yes, exactly. So basically, the communication graph is formed by reversing the edges of the orientation of the physical yes. graph, right? Yes. So you're doing distributed optimization for control of the model. For control. Yes. Okay. Let's move. Uh, so, okay. We have had some design parameters. We need to Pick, you need to select the values of those, those design parameters such that the system, the controller, they converge. So we have some uh, theoretical results, and we prove that uh, if the design parameters satisfy certain conditions, the algorithm will converge. Okay. Now we select, we have some uh, numerical results for the IEEE 33 bus system. We have 29 load buses, three generator buses, one Thailand bus, and we assume that the Communication network, communication network transmits feedback information every 20 milliseconds. And the independent system operator sends a new regulation signal every four seconds. So here we have, we have all four results. So we took the value of these regulation signals from PJM website, and you can see that we can perfectly follow the, uh, uh, the regulation signal sent by the independent system operator. So in this study, we Propose a set of uh, controllers for computing the set points in a distributed fashion. Such and the controllers ensure that we can follow the regulation signals. So the set points are computed such that the DRs can meet the regulation signals collectively, all while all the physical constraints are set. My collaborators in this study are Maggie and Professor Denis Garcia. We are one set of two values for very half of your time. <laughs> no, I, I was five minutes behind. <laughs> Keep going. Okay. Now we'll let's ask, move. <clears throat> we'll ask this question from the question. Okay. Let's move to the interstate. Now I talked about energy system. Now let's move to the interstate water and energy system. 
Optimal water flow. Okay. Totally different story. I mentioned totally but very different story. So in water supply networks, we have reservoirs, we have pumps, we have tanks, we have junctions, and we have pipes. Again, we have a system the water network operator. So in water network of in water networks, we need energy to pump water to overcome geograph geographically given pressure head differences. Okay. So, so okay. In the past, water uh, grid operator they looked at water networks just as loads. So basically, water network is a load. The power grid operator sends a price signal to the water network operator, and then water network operator is going to schedule its resources, its uh, basically pumps and vats. So uh, and at the end, it will have a, a load for the power grid operator. And as we know, power grid operator, they want to control the loads as much as they can. And they have used dynamics uh, pricing scheme to achieve their goals. And in recent years, uh, water network operators, they have realized that they can minimize their energy costs by following the price, the electricity price signal. So they try to schedule their resources to minimize their cost. Okay, so what is the optimal water flow? Basically, you want to minimize some kind of cost, energy cost, and such that all the flow and energy conservation constraints are satisfied. You want to deliver water. Okay, why is, it, uh, is this is important? Okay, this problem determines the value of water flows and pressure heads, determines the network topology, and determines the cost, the cost of energy. And it also can be generous to other problems in water networks, such as energy efficiency, water planning, and uh, wastewater management. Okay. Now, the question are these problems easy to solve? Uh, the answer is no, because hydraulic constraints, they define non convex physical sets, pump head gains and pump head losses. In addition, we have pumps and valves. Pumps and valves, they are either on or off. And then they are on, they have some, they have a continuous uh, state. Consider that this network water flow on the left side. So let's assume that this pump is off and there's a valve here, this, there's a tank here, so there's a valve here, and there is no flow between uh, this node and node 14. So basically, the network topology will change. And, this, and to, to, to model these uh, systems, we need to introduce some boundary variables. So, in summary, optimal water flow problem is a Mixed integer non convex program, non network. Okay? This problem, people have looked at this problem since 1980, and they have tried to uh, propose some uh, control strategy, uh, different approximation, linear or non linear, to solve this problem and to basically to optimize the energy cost to different metrics. And there are several solvers uh, out there. But unfortunately, we, it's very hard to say that what, is, what people are doing right now. Because uh, this area is not very clean. So I have a question. Yes. And uh, give us this one. Good question. Uh, so there are different time scales. So one is this. Okay, let's slow time scale maybe 24 hours. Okay, this is uh, again, it's not clear to me what they are doing in their practice. The problem is uh, uh, unlike power systems, water network uh, operator, water network, water supply systems. They do not have a very, very clear uh, say story what is happening right now. But in the rest of the paper, they have talked about these time scales, uh, 24 hours or like 12 hours ahead. This is, what, uh, this is my, my approach. This is my knowledge. OK. Uh, my approach to this problem is a convex relaxation approach. So convex relaxation, we have a non-convex feasible set. So if the relaxation solution, relax solution ends up here, we just uh, bound uh, some optimality. And if the solution ends up here, we are lucky, and then we got an optimal solution, which is feasible for the system. My work is, I will say, work on this from 2017, and in 2015 and 17, and there are some other works done in recent years by other researchers. OK, I propose the second order con relaxation for optimal water flow problem. And identify a set of conditions under which this relaxation is exact, and then propose an algorithm for recovering uh, an optimal solution from the computed uh, solution. Then the, all the sufficient conditions are satisfied. Okay. 
So now the question you might ask is that, so why second order cone relaxation? Basically, I transform this mixed integer nonlinear program into a mixed integer second order cone program. So the question is why? If you consider the class of mixed integer nonlinear programs, it's a big uh, class, and then we have a mixed integer convex program, and then mixed integer second order cone programs. There are some powerful algorithms for solving mixed integer second order cone programs. The reality is that the algorithm that we can use for solving mixed integer linear programs can be used for solving mixed integer second order components. I'm not going to talk about that now, but you can talk about it often. So, convex relaxation results. Okay, we want to compute the power flow, uh, water flow, pressure head, and the network topology, the binary variables. Okay. Maybe this is slide. The feasible set. The feasible set is given by hydraulic constraints, flow conservation constraints, and energy conservation constraints. Any questions? Or are you following me? Good. So, flow conservation constraints. It's easy. We have the nodes are either junctions or tanks. At each node, we need to ensure uh, that incoming flow is, is equal to the outgoing flow. And in tanks, at times that k, the, amount, the volume of water in tank i is equal to the volume of water at the previous time step, plus the difference between the incoming flow and the outgoing flow to the tank. Other constraints are a little bit different, they are nonlinear. We have pumps and pipes. Pumps, so here we consider variable speed pumps. So each pump has three variables one, uh, the speed of the pump, uh, head gain, and flow rate. So basically, the gain, the flow rate of the pump, and the speed of the pump. The relationship between these uh, variables is given by a quadratic equation. Quadratic equation. And pipes, each pipe has a friction head loss. So basically, when water flows over the pipe, we lose some energy. This loss is typically modeled by two, there are two models for modeling friction head losses, Darcy Washbach and Hazen Williams. In this study, I'll focus on the first one, however, the results can be extended to the second one. What do the pumps do? Is it, so you have a flow here, right? Yes. So uh, the, it just increases the pressure itself. Pressure. So it's like injecting pressure. Exactly. I'm trying to think of it from a flow network perspective. Yes. So it just increases. Increases the pressure. And it's a quadratic function of the flow that it sees. Quant yes. Okay. But everything is static in the sense we don't have dynamics. No, we don't have dynamics. No, the time scale is not. Uh, everything is instantaneous as long as it obeys these. Yes. Which is perhaps an approximation of like an hour or so. Uh, yes. Time scale must uh, be some five to ten minutes. Okay, so we have non convex feasible set. Basically, we have pumps and pipes, non linear, and we have binary variables here. Okay, let's go faster. Uh, now, the convex ratio of the pump hydraulic constraints. Okay, we have a equality, a quadratic equality constraint. So, what we are going to do, we are the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to move from the space of uh, speed, flow rate, and gain. To the space of only flow rate and head gain. We can show that there is a uh, there is a one-to-one -one map between these two spaces. So we just work on the uh, space of uh, flow rate and gain. So feasible set we, uh, we consider the flow flow rate versus uh, head gain. We have the feasible set between the blue line, the blue curve, and the red curve, which is a non-convex set. So we can we convexify this set by just considering the tangent line to the red here. here. So we, we can see this area as a feasible set for the uh, uh, flow rate and gain. And we propose and we propose a kind of conic relaxation for the for the uh, uh, pipe uh, pipe uh, head losses. Basically. So now all the uh, non-binary variables are non-binary constraints are either linear convex or convex quadratic or basically second order one. This is the result. Now we saw the, the relaxed problem, and the result is as follows. So we have a water network, and we have an old, uh, often water flow problem, and we have the second order quantum relaxation. 
the solution to the relaxed order con uh, second order con relaxation is exact if in each junction with multiple incoming pipes, each junction with multiple incoming pipes, the incoming pipes are equipped with pressure reducing valves. Pressure reducing valves, they act like a resistance. So they reduce the head gain, the head gain between two nodes. Let's say you have node I and node J. There is a pressure reducing valve between these two nodes. So PRVs, pressure reducing valve, they reduce the head gain. I am going to skip these two slides. Uh, I'm going to just show you some results. Here I just picked this very small network. I'll tell you why later. Uh, so in this small network, we have two reservoirs here, at node 11 and 10, and we have four pipes. We have tanks at node 12 and 13. And use a very simple uh, price system. They assume that the price of electricity is one dollar per kilowatt hour between 12 a.m. 12 a.m. to 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. and the price is 10 dollar uh, between 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. So just to show that the system is working, okay. When the price is uh, cheap, we are going to use the pumps to to pump water into tanks, and when the price is expensive, we are going to use the water in tanks, and then when the price is uh, cheap again, we are going to uh, pump water into tanks. So now the question is why they keep this small uh, network? So I try to compute the same results by using uh, some solver which can solve, they say that they can solve mixed integer nonlinear programs. And even for this small network, it took maybe more than one hour to solve the problem. However, this mixed integer second order relaxation can solve the problem in maybe a few seconds. So basically the message is here is that we proposed uh, a tractable basis for computer for uh, further sense of interaction between water and energy uh, energy in water supply networks. Any questions or comments? Okay. My collaborator is uh, Dr. Josh Taylor at the University of Toronto. Now I move to the, the my recent uh, the recent problem that I worked on. Energy harvesting in water supply networks. Okay. Renew renewable energy uh, integration of renewable energy is, is increasing. So we will have more and more renewable in the near future. As we know, we, we may not be able to utilize all the renewable energy that we have at this time. So basically, sometimes we curtail renewable energy or we uh, just store energy in storage units. I tried to find some data for curtailments in today, but I could not find any data, and I used just this graph. Uh, there, was a, there was a recent study done uh, by people at Enwell, and they have shown that they are focused on aircraft, and they consider three scenarios. So with the integration of uh, renewable energy, so let's assume that so the fraction of annual energy from uh, renewable sources, 50% to 55%. As you can see, the curtail energy is increasing exponentially. Also, in a day also, they provide some data from 2012, as you can see for two days at different times of the day. So the curtail energy is quite uh, high. At different, I mean, at different times of the day, it can be relatively high. So grid operator either curtails surplus energy or you utilize energy storage unit to basically to absorb the surplus energy. So the idea here is that we want to utilize pumps and tanks. We have two networks. We have two large scale, large scale infrastructures. We have renewable energy here and we have a demand here. So we want to utilize both pumps and tanks to, to harvest the surplus energy, renewable energy in water tanks as a potential energy. Okay? So basically we want to harvest the surplus energy while we deliver all the uh, desired the, the load at the desired pressure heads and we minimize the electricity costs. Any questions or comments? Clear? What's the, What's the point? 
What's the objective? What's the objective? I'll come to that. Okay. So the point, so why, okay, I'll read the answer the question in a bit. So why we need to do, we want to do that? There are three benefits. So why is operators, they minimize their electricity costs. Green operators, they use their resources, the energy resources more efficiently. And green, and we can minimize, we can reduce gas, greenhouse gas emissions. These are the benefits. So, can we do that? Yes, we can do that. We can do that through a demand response program in, a, in an energy market. Uh, basically, basically, the program that aim to increase dem uh, demand at times of high generation. Okay. So, what is the demand response program? Let me faster. So, we have to consider a contract of length T, K time slot. The, the mobile network operator has declared its capacity. Or board. This is the amount of energy that I can take at the uh, amount of power that I can take at each time instant at each time slot. And the, one, uh, the system of the grid operator is going to send a uh, demand response signal or K at times of K. And the wire network operator is going to take this amount of power energy from the grid and use it. Until I will tell you how they can use it. So now I see the timeline. Is us completing the offer and then going to the energy market and then real time operation. Here we focus on the real time operation. So in real time, let's focus uh, on the real time operation. At each time slot K, the, the wallet operator is going to receive, uh, estimate its demand and then uh, receive the price signal from the wallet, the, from the grid operator and receives a demand response signal from the a grid operator. So now to compute the set points, we propose a two-step procedure for compute the set points. Now the idea is as follows. Okay, we receive some surplus energy from the grid, and we need to deliver what the demand, the water water demand at uh, the desired pressure heads. Now, either two two scenarios can be considered. Scenario one: this power is not enough to deliver the loads at time is not kept. If it is not enough, then we need to purchase the different the imbalance from the energy market. Or if it is enough to deliver all the loads, we might have some surplus energy, and then we need to harvest the surplus energy in the tanks. So now, what is the objective? Good question. So in step one, in step one, okay, we are going to need a compute a solution to this problem. So what is this problem? The objective is the cost of energy. Basically, we have lambda the cost of energy and uh, just represents the amount of energy that we need to operate pump between node I and J at pressure head G and uh, with flow rate Q. So basically, we minimize the cost of uh, energy at time slot Q. We complete the solution to this problem. Okay, now we complete the solution to this problem, and then we compute the energy consumption of the pumps based on this solution. So now, Two cases can be considered. Either this, uh, the computed energy, this energy is greater than the received energy from the grid operator, then it means we need to purchase the difference, the imbalance from the energy uh, from the energy market. If that's the case, we can use the set points computed by this uh, uh, by solving this optimization problem for scheduling the pumps and valves, different components, and we just uh, purchase the difference from there. Uh, electricity much. Now, this, the second uh, scenario is that the, uh, the computed uh, set points, so basically the, this energy is less than the energy that is provided to us, to the water network operator. Basically, we have more energy. We need to, we can harvest the, the difference in the tanks. So in this case, the computed set point is not, uh, is not necessarily optimal for the water network operator. Basically, in this case, we need to compute a set point that uh, help us to harvest, maximize the amount of energy that we can harvest in the tanks. The tanks. So basically, we consider the amount, the objective function as the amount of energy that we, are, we, can, we can harvest in the tanks. Subject so to flow and energy conservation constraints, and we can we add one more constraint to ensure that the amount of energy that we are going to take from the grid. Is going to be less than the amount of energy that is provided to us. So we are going to take more energy. 
because we do not want to pay for more energy that is not needed at this time. Okay? Is, are these two steps clear to everyone? No. Again, these problems are hard to solve. I moved and non consistent set. So this is study mainly uh, the technical results are based on my previous study. So we propose a second or relaxation. We identified sufficient condition for uh, exactness, and we propose an algorithm for computing uh, for recovery an optimal solution if the solution is not exact. And we have very similar uh, theorem to show that these two problems are. Uh, equivalent, basically optimal water flow and the second order core relaxation are equivalent. Let me just then let's talk about the numerical results. So I consider this network. We have four reservoirs. We have uh, four pumps here between seven and six, two and seven, also four pumps here. We have two tanks. We consider demand response program. We assume that the grid operator is going to send a new demand response signal every five minutes. And because we do not have any data, this time we generate some uh, random uh, demand, demand response signal. This is the black curve here. So, and uh, there are two responses. Uh, one is the current practice, so no energy harvesting. So this shows the amount of energy taken by the water network over the different time, over the time. And the, and the response of the water flow operator, if it's going to harvest the surplus energy provided by the uh, grid operation. And here I'm trying to just show that when we have some surplus energy, we are increasing the, water, the amount of water that's going to be stored in the tanks. As in, because we have some surplus energy, we, are, we do not need that energy at this time, we are going to move water in the tanks and we use it later. Basically, we use the pressure head that is stored in the tanks at the uh, later when it is needed. So in summary, we had uh, we have so we proposed an architecture for harvesting renewable energy in water networks, and there are three benefits. So water network can minimize its energy cost. Electric power uh, network can use its uh, resources more efficiently, and more importantly, cooperate by the co by cooperation between water and energy sectors, we can minimize uh, we can reduce gas uh, greenhouse gas emissions. <coughs> My collaborators are Professor uh, Domingos Garcia and Professor Pixar in this study. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any questions or comments? <laughs> So I have a different opinion on these water energy nexus problems. People they think when they talk about water energy, they think that they should optimize things directly. But uh, I'm not sure if people are in practice they are looking for more headache. So no one looks for headache. So I think we need to come up with solutions that are improving the situation right now, but without uh, without adding more complex to the, to the systems. Well, I mean, that's a good job. Yes. 
Do you have a case with one water tower, one one <laughs> wind turbine? Yeah. 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 yeah, so that it's instead of making it more complicated, it's like a single machine infinite bus kind of a problem. Are you for any mechanisms or just uh, uh, just just to see the <coughs> the exchange easier? Single, single pump, single tank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> SPSP. No, no, but I we have to put you on crazy. Okay. Yes. So you mentioned the problem with the time scale for the water supply system. Right. So even if they're like they can they want to join the demand uh, response program, they still have to change the way they operate the water supply, right? They have to change the what's okay. Mm -hmm. You have like five minute resolution there? Yes. And you're saying that it was a twelve hour or twenty four hour? Yes. Did I get that wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I'm not sure. It's, I, I, I don't understand your question. I mean, uh, I don't see how like, they would have to change up, uh, the flows every five minutes, right? Like. Uh, yes, they have to compute. So yes, uh, there is one step that I removed it here. Uh, okay. So even in current system, they need to they need to change the set points every maybe five minutes or maybe ten minutes because uh, so there are, there should be two time at least two times. The one is the slow time scale. Let's say twenty four hours. Uh, in advance, they compute some set points, and in real time, they need to change the set points because uh, they have some. There is some uncertainty on the loads. They cannot perfectly know okay what would be the demand, what the demand in the next hour. So, in real time, there is a change in the set points. Yes. Question or comments? Yeah. Question. Back to the thing about the who gains the electric. Operator gains because there's a market for the wind or something like that, right? Because so they're going to make more money because they don't have to turn off. The yes, pressure. exactly. And at the same time, the water operator gets means yes cheap stuff. So yes. both people win. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So this is the this is the first. Step. I mean, we just finished this uh, study. I mean, yes, there are many ideas for the next step and. Also, there are some, we need some policies uh, to the, the government, uh, they have to develop some policies for the cooperation between water and energy sectors. So it's not just, uh, this is really just the first step. It's not, I'm not saying that these, these benefits are going to be realized. No, they will not be realized very soon. Okay? There are more things to do. And, and you could also add <coughs> the use of the stored water as a pumped hydro. Uh, like the Swiss pump. Uh, actually, when you started this, I thought that is what you were going to say. Yeah, about. Well, I did too, but yeah. uh, no, there's nothing, none of that here, right? You can utilize this. You're not generating water. anything from the storage. No. Network as a as a network energy source. Yeah. Right. That's what I was I was thinking about. I didn't say it. Sorry. It's not really about the energy. Like Getting generation the from the stored water. Yeah. Um, is there any way to do that? And it's something yes. Yes. Put a generator in the tank. What? You can have one place where there's a pump hydro installation, and the rest of the network sort of supplies the water for that. That's what I was initially thinking. Well, you can do it with a single machine. A single machine. It's called single pump, single tank. Two generators. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.